Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Damon Rand, and uh, today we're going to be presenting a talk on uh, something we've been working on the past few years, um, it, which is developing a processing and analysis pipeline um, for monitoring deforestation uh, via satellite. Um, with me is Pork Harley and Jill Bornassal, who will also be uh, sharing the stage with me today. Um, and, oh, absent is, uh, unfortunately, is Ryan Elfman, who was originally scheduled to be one of the speakers today. Uh, he is in Kenya, so couldn't join us, um, but he did a lot of the technical implementation on of the change detection itself. Um, so, if you do have any questions, we've set up an email address uh, that you can email us, and we'll try and, if you have super technical questions, we'll try to, as best as we can, to answer them, but... Um, if not, uh, we have an email address for you, and uh, you can send them there. Uh, so we are Ecometrica. Uh, we're a software-as-a-service company founded in climate science, and we're passionate about clear, correct, meaningful sustainability management tools to help businesses meet their sustainability challenges. To that end, we have two main products. One's a sus sustainability reporting platform uh, that is uh, basically a greenhouse gas accounting platform. Uh, uh, system, and we have also have a mapping platform, which we're going to be talking about more today. Uh, and Jill will be giving a, a bit a bit of a demo on uh, for combining client spatial information with Earth observation data. Uh, so, yeah, if you do have any questions for us, you can email us at fos4g at ecometrica.com, and we'll get you an answer to your question as soon as we can. Uh, so, the project that this all came about out of was called Forest 2020. And it's a major investment by the UK Space Agency as part of an international partnership program to help protect and restore up to 300 million hectares of tropical forests by improving forest monitoring in six partner countries using advanced uses of satellite data. Uh, those are the partner countries there, Mexico, Ghana, a few others, Brazil. Um, and these are the partners, uh, various companies involved, various uh, academic institutions as well. And the challenge for us was to develop an end-to-end -end pipeline for processing radar imagery to detect forest loss. Essentially, given an area and a range of time, we want to automate the rest of the process. So we want a cloud-based service. Uh, we need to be able to fetch terabytes of data. Uh, we want to pre-process and clean the data, run the change detection algorithm on it, and diff the output against the forest baseline map. Uh, it, in this case, we used Hansen. Um, some of the open source tools and open data we're using, uh, Ubuntu, Python, Docker, the ESA Snap tool, GDAL, Araster IO, Fiona, uh, ND, which is the change detection library by Johannes Hansen at the University of Edinburgh, uh, X-Array, uh, we use Mapbox GLJS uh, and React on our front end interface, uh, so you can visualize it, and we use Sentinel and the Hansen data set. Uh, so the objective was to scale the service out to be able to handle thousands, tens of thousands of areas, uh, generalize across multiple forest types, ideally, and provide historical and near real-time analysis, and be an end-to-end -end service. Uh, not all of these objectives have been yet met yet. We're still working on this for uh, this project as well as other uh, clients as well. So uh, where we're getting our data from is Sentinel. Uh, this is the Sentinel satellite, and we're working with the C-band synthetic aperture radar data. And you can see Sentinel works um, basically like this. There's two satellites that go around the Earth uh, and create these swaths. And so uh, imagine if you're looking at areas within these swaths at certain points in time, you know, you don't like the satellites move. And so depending on when you want when you're taking your time, uh, the satellites are going to be in different positions. So you have to basically calculate all the different images you're going to need from the satellite. So if looking at uh, my colleague Porrick's uh, homeland here in Ireland, if you wanted to uh, get all the images for one year period from August to 2018 to 2019, uh, you're looking at 4.5 gigs per zipped image, and it's going to take 2,000 and 65 images as an example. So uh, the change detection itself, how do we do it? So uh, we get the clean SAR VRTs, uh, one for each date in the time series, and then we 
process those using the ND library. Basically what this does is it outputs a frequency of change per pixel. Uh, then we clip that against a forest, non-forest map baseline uh, to measure the change in forest and we extract the pixels that have a change uh, of a threshold of greater than two. Uh, this was basically um, that number was a result of a lot of trial and error and Anal analysis after the fact, and the output is then a r is a raster, which is then vectorized to a shapefile and prepped for visualization in our mapping platform. And now I'm going to turn it over to Pork, who's going to talk to you about the AWS pipeline that we built uh, to go along with this. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so. Can everybody hear me okay? Is it good? Yeah. Um, so yeah, here's the schematic for how we actually get all of the um, setup going. You first you get your area of interest. We serialize it to just a, a standard text wicket um, from our front end, and we send it back to the actual cloud, uh, the, uh, the change detection uh, system from there. Uh, so you give it this particular date range that you're actually interested in, and then we do the search and filter against Copernicus or one of the DS providers to actually pull down those particular images that are required for that. Um, we upload those zip files that we do get up onto S3, and then we do uh, we use Snap to then do the pre-processing uh, for the subsets of the areas from those images that we actually care about. Um, so once we have all of that and we mosaic it into actual useful images for us, uh, we then use our data cube with X-ray, which you've been hearing a lot about, I think, uh, during the conference, and we uh, use the forest baseline then to actually figure out what the metrics are and get the decision rules. And at that point, we also do some manual validation. If the thresholds are kind of in the in the middle area, we'll double check those ones. If we're happy with the from the, from the automated validation, then we're okay with it, and then we send the results back to the website. Um, so the first thing is the actual Sentinel APIs. So I know there's a lot of uh, ESA and Copernicus crew here, and some people from, I think, Creodius are in the lobby as well. Um, so Copernicus itself is fairly slow, mainly because it's handling it for everybody for free so they actually have to keep it at a fairly solid level um, make sure they're not giving everybody too much there's limited two concurrent downloads per person so we don't want to throttle it from that side of things as well um, but it's free it's stable and the api is really really good and there's a lot of uh, python apis and stuff or wrappers for it as well which really helps uh, ds like creodis they're here uh, they're fast they have multiple locations and providers so it means you're not always knocking out copernicus if you're actually trying to make these queries. Um, the pricing's mixed. Some things are still available for free. Others are they have their own platforms as well, which cost money. But you can um, you can see which uh, which providers are actually uh, giving what you need for it. Uh, they're in development. There's a lot of APIs. They're not all the same as Copernicus. I think don't know if every one of them supports the Open Search API yet. But um, they also have a lot of stuff for their actual individual logins and everything as well, um, which makes it a bit difficult when you have to manage a whole load of different ones. Um, so if any else is working on a library to access all of them at the same time um, maybe talk to us afterwards because we're also doing that so we can pull resources um, also the other one is the AWS open data registry um, that's on EU central one request or pay so don't request more than you need because it'll cost you more money uh, it'll only have Sentinel ones GRDs and SL SL one C's and L two A's for the Sentinel two uh, and it's the s3 API that you're gonna have to use again there for that uh, the ESA snap tool, uh, for myself, it was pretty difficult figuring out Java because I've always done a lot more Python work. Uh, so when something went wrong, it took a while to figure out what was going on. The documentation, for the same reason, is mixed because it's a lot of J a uh, Java API documentation, uh, though I know they got a lot of tutorials online as well, but normally they're not in the areas that we've had curiosities in. Um, make sure that you have at least eight gigs of RAM for uh, whatever processing you're needing because the Java JVM needs that much to just get going with the amount of data that we're pushing through it. But the support forum is good and the devs are active and I think he, uh, Monday, Monday they, or Wednesday they had the talk about the Snap 7 which just came out in July as well. And the GUI is really good for generating those process graphs for terrain correction and subsetting and everything and it's a really good tool to make sure that you know what you're getting first. Um, Docker uh, allows you to actually do that scoping of CPU and RAM, so you know you need at least 8 gigs of RAM or anything like that, you can provision 
provision it there, you can make sure it's not taking over the rest of your system if you're testing locally. Uh, it also means that when you're running in the cloud, you can actually set very fixed amounts of RAM and you can run, it's not gonna eat up the entire thing, so that's good. Uh, it's scalable, the build is fixed and it's reproducible, uh, which means that we all the different devs and the analysts can all check it out and we can scale it out quite horizontally on the cloud, which has been very useful. Um, Dependencies uh, can cause the images to be really, really big. That's one of the things we're hoping to fix this year. Uh, and you might need more cleanup steps, and it's another tool for people to learn uh, at the same time. So we use uh, Elastic Container Service on AWS for managing this. Uh, there's two main options you have with that. There's Fargate and there's EC2 for self-managing it. So Fargate, you choose how much CPU you want, you choose how much RAM you want, you choose where in the world you want to do it, and um, it'll provision it themselves uh, away from the rest of your things and they just manage it for you. The problem you have there is that the container size is maxed out and fixed at the 10 gig limit, which is a Docker default limit as well. Um, you can try and expand it with uh, EBS and things, but configuring that with Fargate has been an issue, so we gave up on that part of it, but we still use it for actually doing the download management uh, from Copernicus and Sentinel. Um, and it's also a bit more expensive because they're managing more, so they charge you more. Um, the EC2 part, you, it's self-managed, you have to choose basically everything, the EC2 instance types, you have to handle your own errors. Uh, you're using AWS's uh, base AMIs for it, or either the Buntu ones or their own ones. Um, so they handle the actual putting the Docker containers running on every single instance for you, so that's great. And then you choose what kind of storage you want actually on the machine as well. Um, you can and you should use Spotfleet whenever you're doing this, bid low and try and get as many as you can depending on what resources you need. There is also things like AWS Batch and there's more Lambda things coming, but uh, Batch we couldn't debug easily. We needed to be able to be on the system to actually double check that everything was working as we expected and sometimes you need to clean out some old dead containers uh, before the auto one normally would. Um, and Lambda, at the time, didn't have enough of a uh, ability for us on that. Uh, so lessons learned on this, uh, probably one that you already know, use S3 a lot, use it heavily if you're on AWS. Try and avoid using e EBS and snapshots for storing all of your data. Make sure that S3 is your main storage location. You do a computation, you get your cached results from that. That either goes into ElastiCache or you're dumping the file computed back into S3 as soon as possible. Uh, S3 to AWS, as long as you're in the same region, um, the costs are n basically nothing for the actual transfers, so make sure you're doing wherever your files are and you're computing in the same, in the same region to avoid that cost, especially like if, uh, if you're using the open data registry stuff, that's EU central, so make sure you're also doing your compute in EU central to try and avoid some extra costs there. Uh, EBS is your on, on instance storage or the actual instance store itself. Uh, use that during the runs, but make sure you're clearing everything out as well to avoid uh, a lot of extra crap just lying around afterwards, temp files and things. You don't, you don't want to be paying more for it than you have to. Um, EC2 Spotfleet, use it. Um, avoid on demand for this because if you're, unless you're, I need this task right now and I don't want to fiddle around with thinking about it. Uh, even reserved instancing, if you buy a reserved instancing, you're paying for the entire time you've reserved even if you're not using it. Most of the time you're probably going to be using kind of big spikes of queries, uh, so Spotfleet is really, really good for that. So plan your budget, set a max price that's still fairly sane. Um, EC2 Fleet is a new system for choosing multiple different instance types as well, so you can choose many different families from EC2 at the same time to choose your RAM and memory across what's available. And uh, configure your queues so that each instance should be downloading one image and checking all the areas for that one image um, rather than downloading the same image to many, many containers because that will just make all of your processing a lot slower. And that's me on Jill. Thanks. Okay, so um, cool pipeline, but um, now we want to see a map. So um, what we're doing is that we display those uh, change detection results on our mapping platform. So before I do a quick demo of the mapping platform, I just wanted to give you a really brief background on it. Um, so it's intended as a platform for a wide range of environmental, social, economic data. Um, it aims to simplify the extraction of information of increasing volumes of data that come from Earth observation or other sources. Um, it provides a simple interface for non-user experts uh, to get answers to a variety of questions. And basically it makes special data accessible to the public, to stakeholders and to non-GIS specialists. 
Um, the data can be stored and backed up locally, but the platform runs on the cloud so that we can ensure it's always performing. Um, it works with browser updates and you don't need a local IT person to look after it. And we use agile development so it's frequently updated with new features. This said, we're just going to move on to a little demo of the mapping platform. I've recorded it just to avoid uh, live demo issues, but it's probably going to be epic anyway, so bear with me. Um, all right, so when you just um, first log in onto the app, that's what you see. Um, all the apps are designed around a specific theme to answer a specific question. And this one was designed to present the results of the SAR change detection that Porek and uh, Damon just presented to you. It features results that were produced in window areas for three or four partner countries from Forest 2020, which were in Brazil, Mexico, and Kenya. And today, I'll only have time to present Mexico and Brazil results. So yeah, first thing you see is this introduction box. Um, so that's fully customizable by the user, and it just gives a little bit of information on what this app is designed for um, and some um, kind of narrative info. Um, then we move on to this, uh, the interface menus. First one is the layers. So layers are just visual maps of the data that was uploaded in the back end. Um, that just gives a bit of context. And um, this first layer we're looking at here is the change detection output um, for an area called Brandonia in Brazil. Um, so in orange here, what you see is forest loss that was detected by a change detection between February and September 2018 um, in this specific monitoring area. No, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Gosh. Right. OK. So we're back on track, kind of. And um, so that's, yeah, the change detection. And then we just switching another layer, which is the forest uh, baseline, uh, which we extract from Hanson forest data, but it could come from you know, other sources. Um, and that just shows the forest that was available, that was not available, but present in your studio area uh, before you start monitoring for forest change. And then the other um, kind of uh, menu is the areas of interest. So uh, for this demo, we're just focusing on this subsection of Randonia, which is where we run uh, the change detection. So each area on the application has a results section. And basically, um, when you click result, you just get a summary of what can the platform tell you about this queried polygon. Um, so the results page uh, display uh, results that were extracted by the mapping platform from data layers uploaded in the back end. Um, basically, the, platform, the mapping platform uh, runs query calculations on data sets on this polygon that's queried here. And in this app, uh, we've set up two queries. Uh, the first one returns the amount of uh, forest loss detected by your change detection. So in this subsection, we found out that 555 hectares of forest were lost in this uh, short amount of time uh, for the monitoring period. Uh, so that corresponds to these orange bits we see on the map. And um, that corresponds also to 1.5% of this um, subsection that was deforested. And then the second query is just the results for the forest baseline. So you can see um, how much forest was in this area at the beginning. Uh, so it was about 34% of this polygon that was forest uh, at the beginning of 2018. So that's kind of a first um, out output for this type of like dense forest in Brazil. Um, and then we're just going to look at a second type of forest, a different context in uh, Mexico. So, just moving a bit. Um, so, we're just going to look at the change detection in the context of avocado farming. So, we can just select our Mexico areas here in the application menu and just, um, yeah, using the filter areas table, we just select the avocado uh, area of interest. Um, <clears throat> so, that's uh, where some of the avocado farms are located in the state of Jalisco in Mexico. 
So the first layer we're going to look at is the forest baseline, just to get a bit of context of what's happening in this area. Um, most of the forest is located on the west, on the west of the area of interest. Uh, and uh, the rest of it, like kind of close from the forest, is mostly avocado fields. And then we're looking at the change detection output. So similarly to what we just saw, it's in orange means there was forest loss between February and September 2018. There was some loss in the, in the north, but the majority of the loss was um, kind of detected in this area here in the southwest. Um, and we can use the mapping platform to kind of explore the area a bit more. So um, when you look at the aerial photography in the base map, you see that the forest in this area is pretty fragmented, which is usually means like high risk of deforestation. And also all around it is avocado field. So there's quite a high assumption here that the forest is slowly being cut off to make more space for um, new avocado fields. And just one more tool I wanted to show you on the platform today, which is quite useful in this kind of exploratory work, is that users can hand draw their own polygon of interest. So let's say you're a producer in this area and you just want to look at the state of the forest near your fields. You just hand draw this polygon. You can just give it a name, save it. And then similarly to application polygons, you get a results button. And when you click on it, the platform runs the queries on the fly, and you just get a summary statistics of how much forest was lost as per change detection um, in your area of interest, and how much forest was also present at the beginning of the monitoring period. Right, so um, that's the URL of the app we just presented to you. So feel free to just go and explore it a bit more by yourself. You can send us any questions if you, if you have any. Um, and yeah, that was just a short overview of what the mapping platform can do. There's many more uh, functionalities in this tool, but I hope that that gave a better idea of what the change detection results look like and how they can be used to make informed decisions on uh, supply chain impacts on the environment. Thank you very much. And yeah, we have time for some questions, I think. Thank you. So, I'm very interesting. I'm very interested. I have many questions, but I'll leave it to the to the to the floor. Yes, uh, please speak up so people can hear it. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So the forest mask we use in this project is from Hanson data, so that's already available, you know, forest data uh, that's free to download, and it's a global forest data. So we just download the data and just process it to have a forest baseline that's up to 2018 or whenever is the beginning of our monitoring period. So we don't do any of this processing ourselves. We just use freely available data for the forest mask. But you could use any forest mask you have. If you have your own forest mask that you know is more accurate than the Hanson data, then you could just feed it into the, the change detection. Um, to, answer, to, to answer your other question, um, the, um, for the change detection itself, for the actual metrics, that's mostly been Ryan who uh, did the actual uh, analytics back and forth and testing out a whole different variety of them. But I know he used a lot of, uh, there was random forest being used and a lot in the ND library that Johannes Hansen, different Hansen, uh, made. Um, so he's doing that in Edinburgh and he's collaborating back and forth with Ryan on, on that. So that's, that's an active development. So that tool allows you to actually choose from a wide range of uh, things that you can test on. Yeah, if you have a very specific technical question, please email it to us and we'll get it to Ryan and he can answer it directly for you. Sorry. Yeah, so deforestation in Brazil is obviously a hot topic these days. I've done a little work in Brazil and the, the thing that surprised me the most is how bad the cadastres are there um, because they're self-reported and without apology and without verification and so forth. But they're the primary regulatory in instrument that says has somebody violated the law by deforestating, deforesting more than a fixed percentage or specific areas? Mm -hmm. Have you guys given thought as to what tools might be um, made available to kind of help on that aspect? 
we have done some stuff in the past or what? Well, I, I guess what we're doing here could maybe be seen as a different type of accuracy because we're taking into account different type of forest and terrain and things like that, and we spend quite a lot of time validating the results. But if you have the, like, you know, the national kind of monitoring agency that is producing results and those results are like, used in policy, then you can't really overcome that. So I think it it's like depends. Honest, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, I mean, it's like you can, you can just. Of your work. I mean, it yeah, great. yeah. Is the way yeah, how do you fit in into. So the work we do with Forest 2020, actually, we work with INPE, which is the agency that produces PRODES, which is the national data in, used in Brazil. And so, uh, yeah, we're trying to just collaborate a bit more and see if like, we can help with improving the methodologies to detect forest change. Um, so yeah, that's that's all we do, and hopefully that's going to be enough in the end. But we'll see. <laughs> question and Martin. Oh yeah, just give it. Cool. This question is not particular to your uh, uh, project here, <laughs> but I think your company has a lot of uh, experience working in these environmental monitoring projects. Mm -hmm. So my question is, when you do these computations, I mean, you run them in the cloud and you spawn all these processes. How much? Forest loss did you occur through your computations? I mean, you know, equivalent. Is that, and uh, you know, it's kind of yeah. a devil's advocate question. Uh, is that factored into like tenders these days? Like when, when somebody's tendering, like you're allowed maximally to emit, you know, these. We, we, as a company, we do our own uh, environmental greenhouse gas assessment using our own product. We, we dog food our, our products ourselves. So we do uh, a full greenhouse gas accounting uh, assessment of our own company every year. And we do, uh, we do offset all our emissions, including our travel to this conference. We we do uh, as part of the sustainability. We actually because we re we report and we calculate uh, on our estimations on how much actual computationally cost wise we are as part of our reports. If we are being asked for that, we can actually provide it to any but any um, any. Con uh, any. It's not okay. <laughs> I get your question. It's. I don't think it is. I can double check with our project manager who's looking at Forest 2020 and she's the one who worked on the tender and the proposal. I haven't heard of anything like that, so I don't think it's in the tender. <laughs> it will be a topic. Can I yeah. ask a quick follow-up that's related? Which is just like, since you've done the calculations, like, how much is, no, how much is field question. work flying to Brazil versus no, just these two instances? You know, mm -hmm. How much is like, well, your overall compute versus overall travel? I would imagine the travel is... Uh, I'm sorry. The travel is typically our biggest, uh, our biggest yeah. emitter. Yeah. So I think definitely. You'll consider choosing it in Europe. Using like the model on the European forests. Uh, we're we 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 will use it wherever people want us to use it, basically. Yes. Um, there's we're we're not we're not geographically bound. We're no. using it for a variety of companies right now as well in different regions, um, in Ghana and. Uh, Argentina and as well. Yeah, we do a lot. We do a lot on tropical forest right now. We don't have much, many projects in Europe, but this is like a universal methodology, so you could apply it to any type of forest. Okay. So, uh, yeah, one last question, quick. Uh, just to show back the URL of the project. Oh, oh sure. Sure. Right, go. Yeah. And I think we'll have plenty of time in the coffee break because there's a lot of uh, questions here also because we had a yeah, wind break. We had damage from forest as well, and it would be nice to, to check Thank this. You, Thank you, everybody. <laughs>